uh, today, uh, uh, Will is going to give a seminar titled Interaction Between Turbulence and Cloud Physics and uh, Chemistry Inside from uh, Lab. Uh, so uh, before jo uh, give him to the floor, I wanted to mention that I got an opportunity to work with Will as a, a grad student. He was uh, my uh, advisor. So yeah, so please join me uh, to welcome uh, Will uh, for uh, today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Narendra Har, and thank you all for attending. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come over to this side of the mountains. I ha actually haven't been in Washington State on this side of the mountains uh, before, and I'm told that you all arranged this wonderful day just for me, so <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Uh, we, we actually had six inches of snow in Houghton uh, two, two weeks ago, so this is, this is a nice welcome change. In fact, I was even debating whether I ha had to wear long sleeves, but I thought maybe with the air conditioning, I'd better. So as Narendra Harb my, uh, mentioned, my slide, uh, my title, Turbulence and Cloud Microphysics, Insights from the Lab. This is not a picture of my lab. This is a picture that I took from the deck of a research vessel, Sagar Kanya, when I was a graduate student. And as a graduate student, I spent a long time, uh, a lot of time going around the world, setting up my instrument and taking measurements. And this picture in particular illustrates a lot of the things that we care about understanding or understanding more completely through experiments in my lab. So this is this is the Sager Kanya um, where I was standing about there when I took the picture. And uh, so you can see this is a nice convective cell, it's got a rain shaft, it's got some ice up here in the top, uh, and then the ocean underneath. And the, the other logo here, that's our pie chamber logo. If you got an experiment, you got to have a good logo for it. And so this is ours. So let me just talk a little bit about um, our facility and the motivations. Uh, a lot of the work that I'm going to talk about today goes back um, a few years. So the folks who have worked with me, uh, the PIs are mostly me, uh, Raymond Shaw and Claudio Mazzolini. Uh, this group, the second group of people are mostly uh, postdocs who've worked with us. And then the third group of students, our third group are, are students uh, and apologies, Narendra Har, I promised that I would talk about the chamber, so uh, I, I won't talk about our ice nucleation work. Why, why do we do this? In the large scheme of things, so my advisor, Glenn Shaw, uh, advisor in graduate school, was very fond of saying that the planet that we stand on is misnamed. That instead of calling it planet Earth, we should call it planet ocean cloud. Because if you really want to understand the climate of this planet, you have to understand the oceans and you have to understand the clouds. You don't have to understand the earth quite as much. So I'm not a I'm not an oceanographer. So what I'm going to talk most about are the swirly white bits that you see in this picture, you know, visible image looking back at our planet. And what you see is a lot of blue and a lot of white. And the scale of this is, of course, planetary, and you see that the clouds in this picture have some of them have uh, features that are, you know, quarter of a planet size diameter up to, you know, maybe half and then down. And my lab's not that big, so we're going to study processes that are much smaller, but those small scale processes really have an effect on these larger scale phenomenon. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand those smaller scale processes and scale them up. And I'm not going to go through all of the questions that I've posed here on the left hand side. But what I will do is just point out a few of the things that we specifically concentrated on in our chamber. Our chamber, we can create a cloud and hold it for about a day at a time if we want to. And that cloud is turbulent. And if you've flown anywhere, you know, whenever you go through a cloud, it's always turbulent. Does that turbulence have an effect on the cloud microphysical pro properties? 
And the answer is yes, and I'll talk about some of those uh, as we go through the talk. By the way, if anybody has any questions as we go, please feel free to jump in. I, I was quote unquote raised in a department culture where uh, interrupting was not interrupting, was engaging in the conversation. So if you have any questions, jump in, please. So I'll talk about a few specific examples of how we go from something like this down into the scale of a lab. Since this is uh, this topic has been in the news and in science news recently, I thought I would throw this slide in because it is these are topics that we have thought about and considered what can we do in our lab to address some of these questions. So can we make it rain or snow? And there are processes, there are there are programs around the world that are addressing that very problem. There's a lot of water over our head. And a lot of times it stays over our head. So could we persuade some of that cloud water to deposit on the ground where we could more easily use it for things that we want to use it for? So is there something we could do to those clouds that would induce them to precipitate? And um, the, the answer, as many of you know, is if it's not going to rain, there is nothing you can do to make it rain or snow. However, if it is going to rain, or, or maybe if it's just on the edge, you can tip it over, or you could make it rain a little bit more. And it turns out that if you could, as a government, if you could pay money to get 10% more water in your reservoirs or 10% more water in the snowpack that you could use then later in the summer, you would pay to do it. And there are people who are doing it. There's a risk though. The thing that you do to try to make it rain more might make it rain less. And we need to understand the processes that differentiate those two. And my claim is we can start some of those processes in the lab. Could we make some of these clouds a little bit brighter so that they act as a cooling mechanism, some geoengineering and mitigation of global climate change? Now, some of you may be thinking this is a horrible idea. We shouldn't be messing around with Earth's climate. And the truth is we're already messing around with Earth's climate. And yes, it is any of these ideas. I, I, and this is me talking, this is, um, I think they are phenomenally bad ideas. However, doing nothing is an even more phenomenally bad idea. So if we're going to do something, maybe we should try to understand what the consequences we are going to be facing if we do that thing. Maybe we should understand those consequences a little bit better, and some of that could start in the lab. And then just briefly, one more thing about why cloud microphysics matter. So that picture right there is the Otter River. You can tell it's fall. So this is September in Houghton. And one of my pastimes is fly fishing. So I took that picture from a bridge. I was about to go downstream there uh, fishing for trout. And I heard th thunder rumbling in the background. And I was going to be standing in this river waving a carbon fiber rod around, which is a very good lightning rod. And so despite the fact that I had driven 45 minutes to get there and I really wanted to go fishing, I decided that it would not be prudent for me to be standing in the river waving a lightning rod around with thunder in the background because I could just see the headlines in the paper. Local professor killed, struck by lightning. He should have known better. <laughs> This is something he studies. <laughs> what does this have to do? Turns out lightning depends on processes that happen at the scale of single crystals and cloud droplets. So we want to understand these small scale processes. This slide is not out of order. I worked in a newspaper when I was in high school and what they taught me was tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them and then tell them what you told them. So this is me telling you what I'm going to tell you. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about how turbulence can affect cloud activation. The traditional model that we all learned in first year cloud physics is based on every aerosol particle in a parcel feeling a supersaturation. And I'm going to try and convince you that that model has some limitations and how we might address it. I will also show you that you can get a cloud forming even when the mean relative humidity is less than 100 percent. I'll talk about what it would take to glaciate a cloud. So go to your favorite place where you find super cold water clouds. Ask the question, what would it take for me to completely turn that cloud to ice? How many aerosol particles would I have to inject? Those and those aerosol particles have to be ice nucleating particles. So how many ice nucleating particles would I have to inject to completely turn that cloud to ice? And that's a little bit of a trick question because it's not how many, but how many and how big. And in, if this is the condition that you satisfy, then you can glaciate the cloud. And then I will talk about um, one of the current questions in how cloudy air mixes with dry air is what's the effect on the cloud droplet size distribution? And we've done some experiments in the chamber to what I think will help resolve some of those questions. Uh, and then I left two other questions here. The uh, end is a bigger version of the chamber in the future. I don't know the answer to that, but we are drawing up the plans for it. So if you want to build a larger chamber, so if any of you have $30 million sitting around that you can't wait to spend, come talk to me afterwards, please, because that's about the price of the chamber. Uh, and and we're, we've been talking about what it would, what such a chamber would look like, why it would look the way it would look, and what it would take to get it to that point. And then can we study clouds on other planets in the lab? And the answer is yes. And uh, I'm part of a team that is designing and building a chamber at JPL to study extrasolar planets. I'll give you a flavor. Uh, clouds on our planet are made of water. Clouds on Venus are made of sulfuric acid. Now there are some really interesting questions about Venusian clouds that you could study in a cloud chamber. Now, making a cloud of sulfuric acid sounds pretty scary, but I think it's possible. Actually, the clouds on Venus are um, straightforward to do in some ways because it, it, as it turns out, they're at a one bar pressure. So you don't have to worry about really low pressures or really high pressures. Uh, and it turns out they're about room temperature. This is that's one of the only other places in the solar system where clouds happen at room temperature. So those two things work in your favor. Now, for example, clouds on Titan, those are liquid methane. And so that's not at one bar uh, and not at room temperature, but there are interesting questions for those clouds too. And addressing some of those questions in the lab is the goal of this facility. All right, I'll give you a brief overview of what the cloud chamber does how we set it up, it's a cylinder. So we have a cylinder, it's two meters across, it's one meter in height. And uh, so that gives you a volume of 3.14 cubic meters. That's why there's a pie on our logo because the volume of the chamber is 3.14 cubic meters. It was also delivered on March 14th, but that was just a coincidence, I promise. What we do is we keep the and I'll I'll talk about this more on the next slide. What we do is we keep the bottom chamber or the bottom surface hot and wet, and the top surface cold and wet. So we have a hot wet surface and a cold wet surface, and the buoyancy difference of the air between those two surfaces drives mixing. So positively buoyant air, negatively buoyant air. The mixing gives us the conditions for cloud formation. As long as you keep those surfaces hot and wet and cold and wet, you can keep the conditions for cloud formation. We've had a cloud in the chamber for 10, 12 hours at a time. 
that gives you the conditions for cloud formation. You get the cloud when you inject aerosol particles. So typically we use something that's soluble. Sodium chloride is easy. Uh, we've also used things like ammonium sulfate or phthalic acid. Um, other people have used things like soot. Basically inject the particle to get cloud formation. And then we pull stuff back out of the chamber to see what happened to it. So what are the size of the cloud droplets? What happened to the particles that the droplets formed on? Those kinds of things. So we do that with optical particle counters, scanning mobility particle sizers, etc. This is the key element for cloud formation for us. So this is a schematic of uh, pressure versus temperature for the vapor pressure of water. The black line is a schematic of the Clausius Clapeyron equation. And what we do is we set the boundaries. So the top surface and the bottom surface are set at some temperature and they're wet. So they represent their points on the Clausius Clapeyron equation. The mixing in the chamber is isobaric and isenthalpic. So it lies on a straight line connecting the two points. So, so take some air from the bottom chamber or from the bottom of the chamber, take some air from the top and mix them together. The resulting temperature will be a linear combination of the temperature of this one and the temperature of this one. And the same for the vapor pressures. Notice that this line is now in the interior of the chamber, away from the surfaces, everywhere above the line representing the clausius clapeyron equation, which means you have supersaturation. That's the reason we have supersaturation in the chamber is because of this nonlinearity in the saturation vapor pressure and the linearity in the mixing process. So the other thing that I'm showing on this line is or this uh, plot. So, so the, uh, the red dot and the dark blue dot is normally how we do it. So we set a temperature difference and that gives us the mean saturation ratio in the chamber. A few years ago, a graduate student working with me, Sean, and a postdoc working with me, uh, Prashant, came to me and said, we want to decouple the temperature difference and the mean saturation ratio. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to put a pool of salty water at the bottom of the chamber. Can we do it? And I said, I don't think that's going to work. And they said, well, we want to try it anyway. I said, well, I don't think it's going to work, but you can try it. And it worked. So this is a uh, for those of you who are considering going into academia at some point, this is a good argument for letting your letting the people who are working with you ignore you to some extent. What that does is it reduces the vapor pressure at the bottom surface. So that you can now. Match the mean saturation ratio, but you can increase the temperature difference between the plates, which means that you increase the fluctuations around the mean. And that's what this uh, histogram at the bottom shows. The mean, so delta T of 7K, the blue line, the mean matches the mean for 8K, 9, 14, but the temperature difference between the plates is getting steadily bigger, which means that the fluctuations around the mean are getting steadily more pronounced. So now we can do experiments where we hold the mean saturation ratio constant and we increase the fluctuations around the mean. What effect, what effect does that have? Before I answer that question, let me tell you just what it looks like when you get a cloud in the chamber. So this is the water vapor concentration in millimoles per cubic meter as a function of time. Notice that I've plotted this a day of year. It goes from 92.3 to 92.55. So this is hours of experimental time. And what we do is we set the chamber up and we have what we call moist conditions, which is we have a temperature difference, it's wet. So we have the conditions for cloud formation, but we're not injecting aerosol. And you can see that the water vapor concentration 
is steady. The red line is um, a five minute moving average with pronounced excursions above and below the mean, which is indicative of the fully developed turbulence in the chamber. Then when we inject aerosol particles, the water vapor concentration drops dramatically and immediately to a new mean. So now the red line has dropped by about 15 millimoles per cubic meter. And that's because we have a cloud in the chamber. So we inject aerosol, we, we form a cloud in the chamber. And in fact, we can look in the chamber and we can see, yes, there's a cloud there. But you still have the pronounced, pronoun, uh, pronounced fluctuations around the mean. The key piece that I want you to take away from this slide is that we can, we can set these conditions up and we can hold them for a long time. So we can stare at this cloud, which is in a, in a dynamic steady state. We can stare at this cloud for hours at a time, which means that we have a long time to say, yes, we actually do see droplets of 20 microns in diameter. We didn't measure five of those droplets in a three second pass through a cloud. We measured hundreds of them over 20 minutes. And then in the next 20 minutes, we measured hundreds more. So this gives us some capabilities to look at relatively rare events in a way that's statistically meaningful. Sure. When you say you can hold a cloud, it's not the same droplet floating around in there, right? They're evaporating and they're reforming. And or is it? It is not the same droplet that is floating around in there. Now, it is the same droplet for a little while. The lifetime of a droplet in the chamber is on the order of a couple of minutes, depending on the size. So that is, um, and it's not monotonic. Depending on the conditions, it may activate, deactivate, and it may go through that cycle a few times. Now, that's not something that we can experimentally probe in the chamber. We we know that from some modeling studies that have been done. But in the end, the fact that we're injecting aerosol particles and they become cloud droplets, they fall out. And so that dynamic equilibrium top equilibrium I'm talking about is the balance between the particles that we're putting in and the particles that eventually settle out of the bottom of the, onto the bottom of the chamber. So that said, not the same droplets, it is the same cloud. Go, go outside and look around. Those are the same clouds, not the same droplets. Because there's a dynamic flux through those, uh, you know, through those clouds at, at too. Another question would be that a lot of clouds the lifetime is only on the order of minutes as opposed to many, many hours. So what you're kind of sampling over many, many hours is kind of representative of what kind of cloud types are you kind of looking at? Stratocumulus. So have you looked at things that are shorter time scales? We've certainly done experiments where, so for example, we can look at what happens if you have a cloud and then you cut off the source. And so now the only particles that are in the chamber are the ones that are in the chamber. You're not replacing them. So you can watch the properties of the cloud change as the droplet number concentration changes as you are removing droplets but not replenishing them. So, so for example, cloud collapse. You might start with a polluted cloud and the number concentration starts to roll off as you deplete the cloud droplet number concentrations. Now that's changing the vapor field because you don't have as much competition for vapor because you have fewer droplets, right? And that's a cascading process. And, and we can see that as, as it happens. That's, we call those transient experiments. I, I will, so, we can also go to lower pressures. So we could create a um, the analog of an ascending cloud parcel through the atmosphere. We can get clouds that way that just doesn't last as long. And so we typically stay with these kinds of scenarios because we've had lots of interesting questions that 
we can answer that nobody else can. Okay. I know I don't need to go over this for this argument for this audience. I'm just going to briefly remind you of a couple of points. Most of what I'm going to talk about today is cloud physics, very little cloud chemistry. This is a little bit of my cloud chemistry, right? So this is the color curve here, critical supersaturation ratio, the, the activation once you get past that, the critical diameter. So we know what the critical diameter is because we can calculate it from Kohler theory. I will also show you a plot. We actually see it in the chamber because we inject Typically, what we do is inject size selected aerosol. So we know that if we measure something in the chamber that has a diameter below that, it's hydrated but not activated. And if we see something above that, then we know it's a cloud droplet. We actually see that clear minimum. Most of the cloud chem most of the chemistry that we're dealing with is on that kappa value right up there in the top in the Raoul term. Admittedly, there can be a little bit of the surface tension uh, in, in the Kelvin term, but most of our focus, when, when we want to change the chemistry, we look at changing the composition, which is changing the kappa value. So what, what is this? Um, wh when I think about this, I, I envision the following scenario. So let's say I was standing here 500 years ago. So that's pre-industrial. And if I sampled aerosol from the atmosphere, what composition would I get? Now, right now, you would get some organics. You get a lot of sulfate. And the sulfate is a lot is dominated by anthropogenic emissions. A lot of the sulfate is from us. And that wouldn't be here 500 years ago. So the aerosol number would certainly change. The aerosol chemistry would certainly have changed. What implications would that have for cloud properties? If you if you were to go to this spot 500 years ago and measure cloud droplet number concentration, is it more than, less than, same as what it is now? I I don't know, but I think it's an interesting question, and. Um, we can we can play around with these kinds of things. So I don't know what the chemical composition 500 years ago would have been, but we can make some guesses at it. And then we can look at, OK, if we put that into a chamber or into a model or something, what happens? OK, here's my idealized model of how aerosol particles become cloud droplets. And I'm using this as a counterpoint because I know most everybody in this room has been through some version of this in introductory atmospheric science. I'm going to use this as a counterpoint to what happens if you add turbulence. So here's my cloud. I'm going to start at point A with an aerosol number distribution. So pick some generic monomodal uh, thing. And I'm going to say, just for the sake of argument, let's just consider a single chemical composition. Pick your favorite substance. And what happens is as you go up through cloud base to point B, the saturation ratio starts climbing, and now you start activating aerosol particles. So some of them will become cloud droplets. Because this is the idealized model of activation, all of those aerosol particles in the parcel that you are considering see the same supersaturation. So if it exceeds the critical supersaturation, every particle of that size and composition activates, becomes a cloud droplet. And you keep doing this. So at point C, maybe, you've now eaten into the size distribution of aerosol particles, right? Where it says activated, those are out as cloud droplets. And that pulls the saturation ratio down, which is what I've represented up here at the top. So going from A, B to C, you get a maximum, and then it decays over time as your cloud droplets get bigger. The point here is that you have a clear demarcation 
in size from the interstitial particles, the ones that did not activate, to the ones that did activate and become cloud droplets. You can tell exactly where that happens. And in fact, if you could measure something like this and you knew that the chemical composition was all the same, all you got to do is look at that size distribution and say the maximum supersaturation in that cloud corresponds to that diameter because I can calculate it from color theory. So I know what that value of S was at the peak supersaturation in the cloud because I can just read it off of the interstitial distribution. Now, the real atmosphere is not so clean because there's multiple compositions out there. But composition is not the only thing that can blur that line. Turbulence can blur, can blur that line. So here's what we did in the chamber. We prepare the chamber with a given temperature difference. And then what we do is we use that scenario that I presented on a previous slide to increase the level of fluctuations around the mean. Does that, does that make a difference? So the triangles are, so the downward pointing triangles are a case where we chose a mean relative humidity, mean supersaturation that was relatively low and then holding the mean constant, we increase the width of the distribution around the mean. That's delta T. Temperature difference of delta T is increasing the, and, and so what we have uh, below that is the energy dissipation rate. But we increase the temperature difference, which increases the fluctuations. And what we see is that more aerosol particles activate and become cloud droplets. We haven't changed the mean supersaturation. So if you went in and, and probed that, which by the way is an extraordinarily difficult measurement, which is actually why I'm not showing that on any of these axes. It's because we can't measure with the precision to, to tell you this is the mean supersaturation in the chamber. But if you could do that, that number isn't changing. What is changing is the fluctuations around the mean. So that distribution is shown here at the bottom is getting wider and wider and the response in the cloud is you're getting more and more droplets more and more of the particles are becoming activated so the activated fraction is the number of particles that become cloud droplets divided by the total number of particles available so it goes from something like 0.2 up to uh, 0.5 in the one case and from about 0.5 up to about 0.6 in in the other case so the effect of turbulence here means that you will have activated more droplets than you would if you just had a single supersaturation why because this acts like a ratchet a fluctuation that goes above the mean will activate those particles and now they're off and growing and they become cloud droplets. A fluctuation below the mean, and that, that, that time scale is short. A fluctuation below the mean will expose a cloud droplet to a lower supersaturation. So in fact, it may want to evaporate that cloud droplet, but it won't deactivate it completely. And so the result is you're biased in the forward direction the, the forward direction and the backwards direction are not equally probable with the result that you end up with more cloud drop. Your PDFs measured or modeled? Sorry? Some combination? The PDFs you're showing, are they measured or modeled or some combination of the two? Uh, these, are, these are measured. So are, are you concerned that they're below one? Okay. Yes. So when I look at PDA, the saturation ratio, those are from the measurements with different temperature, right? The temperature difference, right? Uh, so plus six K, seven K, ten K. Yes. Yes. Okay. So they are not uh, asymmetric, right? So what, like a, by theory, if you impose a turbulent 
equipment fluctuation to the super saturation field, how does the shed the PDF of super saturation looks like because of turbulence fluctuation? So it's it's roughly Gaussian, and our measurements are not at the precision that we could tell the difference between Gaussian and something else at the level that we've measured it. To measure deviations from that, I think we would need to go down further than um, we would need to go further into the tails. Yeah. So, so I'm just wondering because uh, we have a turbulence, and the thinking turbulence always comes with intermittency, right? You have this very inhomogeneous distribution of the energy. So, so there, of course, you have this. I would uh, imagine some kind of intermittency for the temperature to water vapor mix ratio of yield that actually could contribute to a now Gaussian distribution of the super saturation right here. So we 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 don't see the signatures for intermittency at the level of the measurements that we are making. Could that be because the uh, the regular number is not high enough or our Rayleigh numbers are about ten to the nine. Can you talk about why the saturation curves don't go above, above one? Uh, I guess I did open myself up to that. Uh, remind me in a slide. So our conceptual picture is is the following. The conceptual picture at the top here, the vertical line is the critical supersaturation for an aerosol particle. So, so I'm going to say, let's just consider a single aerosol particle, single chemical composition of a single diameter. So it has a critical supersaturation. And now let's think about the distribution of saturation ratio that you could find in the environment. Right, it's always going to be a distribution. Case number one. The mean supersaturation in the environment is bigger than the critical supersaturation. And it's so much bigger. That the fluctuations around the mean don't really matter that much because. Even negative fluctuations below the mean for case one don't take you below the critical supersaturation for the aerosol particle. So you could imagine that you have a 150 nanometer diameter particle of sodium chloride, and the critical supersaturation for that is 0. 0.0 something percent. And if you put that into, into a very strong five meter per second updraft, now, there will be some fluctuations around the mean for the supersaturation in that parcel. But it won't matter because the supersaturation will be so high. That's case one. Now you might have a case where the mean in the environment is bigger than the critical supersaturation, but now it's close enough that fluctuations around the mean could take you below the critical supersaturation. So the mean is still predictive, but there are cases where the particle might not activate because it's in a region where these negative fluctuations are occurring. And now you have case three, which is the mean supersaturation in the environment is lower than the critical supersaturation. So the particle would not activate. Except there's a distribution of values around the mean, some of which are above the critical supersaturation and you can get activation. So case number one, you get cloud droplets. So the aerosol particles are exposed to some critical supersaturation. And, and for details, I would refer you to uh, the paper um, for Sean is the first author. Basically, everything becomes a cloud droplet, and that's that's actually what you see in uh, case A down down on the lower uh, part of the plot. Case two is the middle 
in that row. And what you can see is there's a big mode at small sizes. And in fact, they're all to the left of the thing labeled D sub C, which is critical diameter. We were putting in particles of sizes that we knew and compositions that we knew. So we can tell you what the critical diameter is. So we can say these are interstitial and these are cloud droplets. Now that's interesting in and of itself because this is measurements from the chamber. Presumably there's some mean supersaturation in the chamber. The only thing we were putting in were particles of, and I think these are, do I have it here? Yes, 130 nanometer sodium chloride particles. So we know what they are. And in that condition, there are particles that are both not activated and activated. So it doesn't fit this idealized model, the turbulence matters. And we see this clear separation, we get cloud droplets, and then we get some interstitials. And then C, you don't see that minimum. And actually most of the particles are in that interstitial range, but you see this tail. And that's actually, because we don't see this minimum, we can say there are cases where the cloud droplets form because of the positive fluctuations, but the mean is actually below saturation. Below, well, I should say the mean is below the critical supersaturation for the particle. So the only way that you're getting cloud droplet formation, and, and you gotta, gotta be careful here because we changed the axes, those are not very big. So these small droplets are forming solely because of the fluctuations in the saturation ratio that we're seeing. Now I'll come back to your point. You'll notice that we are not showing a measure of the saturation ratio, and I'll come back to this plot again. Here we did. The way we get these values is we have a Y-core infrared hygrometer in the chamber. Co-located with that, we have a sonic temperature sensor. So we have a measurement of the water vapor concentration over some path, and we have the measurement of temperature over some path. Those paths are close, so we can combine those two to get a value of the saturation ratio. If you go through the argument for how the precision that you need to measure both of those quantities to get something to enable you to say the supersaturation was 0.01%, the answer is you can't do it. Now, we can do it. Notice this is not supersaturation and it's not percent, it's the saturation ratio. You can do it at this level. And we did measure the fact that yes, there, there was this spread in the distribution. Uh, do we have the mean exactly right? No, we don't have the mean exactly right because this is the case, I mean, in this, in this one, you can see that it almost never goes above one. In fact, the blue doesn't. And yet we did see a cloud. So we know that there is an offset here. And that's basically, that's the compromise we have to make is we know there's an offset. We trust that the relative values are right. Is the absolute value correct? That one, we don't have the capability at the moment to say it is right to the level of 0.01%, uh, for example. So we're, am, I, am I on time? I don't know how many slides you have, but it's fine. I mean, I think it's good to have the discussion. It's fine. You have until noon. Okay, okay. Uh, I will speed this up just a little bit then. Uh, what happens when we add ice? So ice is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you, you know that uh, Hiru Nahar worked on uh, a project with me involving ice nucleation. This is um, ice nucleation. Obviously, we got ice. Uh, but we were interested in the response of the cloud. Here's the question. I posed this at the beginning. Take your favorite super cool liquid water cloud, ask the question, what do you got to do to glaciate, to turn all of that to ice? Well, for us, you got to know there's ice. So the way that we do this is 
we inject sodium chloride and Snowmax into the chamber, and we measure the um, distribution of cloud droplets with a phase Doppler interferometer. And the phase Doppler interferometer will give us the correct size for liquid water droplets. And then it will suddenly say, oh, there's a hundred nano, uh, sorry, a hundred micron particle that's in the chamber, which is nonsense. Particles that size would fall out much too quickly to be measured by the phase Doppler. What was happening was it measured an ice crystal that glinted and reflected a lot of light back into the detector and it interpreted that amount of light as the light you would get from a hundred micron droplet. So the fact that we see these values up here means that we had ice in the chamber. And in fact, when we turn off the Snowmax, which gives us the ice, we see that this comes back to some reasonable values and the number concentration of liquid water droplets comes up, which is consistent with the fact that the saturation ratio is adjusting through the Bergeron process, is adjusting to the fact that you've got liquid water and ice now to only liquid water. We also have a holographic system that we use and we can see from holograms of individual particles that some of them are not spherical. And if they're not spherical, then they're ice. And that's how we verify that, in fact, we have ice in the system. By the way, you can also just look in. And when you see glints, you know that there's ice in the chamber. Well, it's it's there. It was ridiculous. There are 100 micron particles. Aren't you showing 50, 75 micron particles? In those so the, these are 50 and 75, yes. Uh, 100 and 200, no. That, I mean, those, those are about the biggest we ever saw. So we start out, black line is a number concentration of ice nucleating particles of zero in the chamber. And then we steadily increase the injection of the ice nucleating particles and we measure the response of the uh, the, the size distribution of uh, what we see in the chamber. And by the time we get up to five per cubic centimeter per minute, we've got a lot of ice. And I will also point out that if you convert this to ice mass, it's completely dominated by the ice because these are 30 microns in diameter and these are only 10. So you, you cube it and suddenly you you see that you've now essentially glaciated your cloud. And in fact, when we look at the critical concentration of ice nucleating particles to glaciate a cloud and we calculate. So so it turns out what you're doing is because because they're they're injected separately. It's not like that the ice nucleating particles are mixed in with the CCN, and that's a difference in the real atmosphere, right? There's just particles in the real atmosphere. What we're doing is we're creating a cloud and then we're injecting separately ice nucleating particles. And the reason that we're getting a glaciated cloud is essentially that the ice nucleating particles are growing so quickly to ice that they pull the saturation ratio down below water saturation. And that turns off the CCN. And we see that, in fact, we've done that. And it turns out it's not the number, it's the integral radius. It's the product of the number concentration and the size of the particles that you have in the chamber. So let me, let me put it to, to you this way. You could inject millions per cc of really tiny crystals. And that would soak up all the water vapor and that would turn off activation of CCN. You could inject five really big ice crystals, and that would soak up all the water vapor, pull the saturation ratio down to one, and turn off activation. So it's the product of how many you inject and how big they are. And by the way, what we ended up with, so that value 
is consistent with the values of integral radii that have been measured in the atmosphere. Yes. So I have a question about this, uh, because we mentioned the number of concentration of the size of the ice particles. So that makes me think about this relaxation time scale of supersaturation. So does it mean that the, the relaxation time for the ice is much faster or that the cloud drop is so that, that they just uh, take away all the uh, water vapor molecules? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So, so in fact, this, this comes from a time scale argument. Okay, I do want to talk briefly about entrainment. I'm going to uh, skip my, um, I'll go very quickly through why this is important because I think maybe for this argument or for this audience, I don't need to convince you that entrainment is important. And if I do need to convince you that entrainment is important, please come talk to me afterwards. Okay. Two ways we can do this. What we're going to do is we're going to mix dry air and cloudy air. And the two extremes that you can imagine is homogeneous mixing, which is when you mix dry air and cloudy air, you do it instantaneously so that every droplet sees the same environment at the same time that every other droplet does. So you could imagine taking cloudy air and instantly reducing the relative humidity to 75%. So now every droplet starts evaporating at the same time because it sees an environment of 75%. Now, the other way you can imagine doing this is more physical, which is that cloudy air and dry air mix through an interface. So you have tendrils of dry air intermixing with tendrils of cloudy air and the only droplets that are responding at any given time to a dry environment are the ones that are right next to the dry environment. And that's called inhomogeneous mixing. The result is in homogeneous mixing, all the droplets get smaller. You may not evaporate any of them, but it shifts them to smaller size. In inhomogeneous mixing, some of the droplets evaporate completely. Those were the ones next to the dry air but the shape of the distribution doesn't change at all. And the way we're going to do this experiment is we're going to put a flange at the top of the chamber. We're going to create a cloud in the chamber and we're going to inject dry air into it. And then we're going to measure what happens in the region before mixing has happened, in the region while mixing has happened, and in the region downstream of where mixing has happened. So three, three regions, and we're going to look at what happens with those. And in the downstream region, so this is after the mixing has happened, that's the blue line. Notice that the shape of the size distribution remains the same, but the number is slightly reduced. In the, in the, um, in the center, which is where the mixing is happening. You can start to see something is happening, but it's not really dramatic. And then in the upwind region, which is before any of this can can have happened because it's upwind of the uh, entrainment. Nothing, nothing has happened. And, and what we're showing you in this second panel here is the normalized distribution. So basically we just want to show you that the shape of the distribution doesn't change. The number concentration definitely does. And that's the signature of inhomogeneous mixing. When we do this for multiple cases, so we have our entrainment flange and we can inject hotter air or more air. And we can then measure it at a place away from the mixing zone to see what the overall response of the cloud is. Right? We're changing the flux. We're making the cloud drier because we're injecting dry air into it. How does the cloud droplet distribution respond to that? And the way it responds to that is the black line is no entrainment. We're not injecting any air. As we steadily increase the amount of air and the temperature that we're injecting, that distribution shifts over to the left. It becomes smaller. That's the signature of homogeneous mixing. 
which makes sense because now it's had time to mix through the entire chamber. That takes longer. And it's not like you have, so every droplet is seeing a same slightly drier environment, which is why, which is why we're seeing this shift here. So conclusion for this is entrainment mixing is locally inhomogeneous, but globally homogeneous. And that's what this, this slide. So locally inhomogeneous mixing, the, so the mean diameter or the shape of the distribution is the same across all three regions. But the liquid water content is decreased as you it is decreased as you mix in more and more of the dry air. So, so again, globally homogeneous, the entire cloud. Locally, the immediate region of the entrainment is inhomogeneous. And this is one of the reasons we think field campaigns have shown conflicting evidence. Depends on where you're flying in the cloud. If you're flying next close to where the entrainment is happening, then you'll see inhomogeneous mixing. If you're flying further away from the immediate entrainment zone, then you'll see the signature of homogeneous mixing because it's had a chance to mix more completely through the cloud. I know I'm running out of time, uh, so I will put up my conclusions slide again. And then since I've shown it to you before, I will briefly go to uh, the cloud chamber is one of the SIF facilities. I know this is a DOE lab, uh, so your relationship with uh, NSF can be a little bit interesting. But if you have if you have collaborators who are working at universities who would like to use a facility like this, there is a way to request its use through the NSF program. And so um, please encourage them to get in touch with us if they're interested. And with that, I will take any questions or further discussion. Thank you. We have one minute left. Yeah, it's good <laughs> to have discussion already in between. So, so from uh, offline attendees, uh, I got some question. So I'm reading from them. So Sakaguchi asked, "What are typical renal numbers uh, use these experiments in this experiment?" So I don't have the Reynolds number for these experiments off the top of my head, but I suspect that. Um, so I will answer the question that I think maybe they're they're asking. Our our Rayleigh numbers are uh, ten to the nine Rayleigh numbers in the atmosphere are bigger. The Reynolds numbers that we have are certainly lower than the Reynolds numbers that you would find in a typical stratocumulus cloud, for example. Our energy dissipation rates are about the same for for stratocumulus. There is a hand up in the audience. Robert, you can unmute and ask a question. Hi, I, you showed this result about the number required uh, as a function of size to glaciate a, a cloud, um, and since you can also control the temperature difference and the turbulence, I'm wondering how that result varies as a function of the activation temperature of the acyclating particles and the turbulence. I wish I could answer that question more completely. The, the temperatures that we were using for that particular study were about minus six. And we would love to be able to go to minus 20. We have a real hard time getting a cloud at minus 20 just because the vapor concentration is so low. Typically for mixed phase conditions, we have to use uh, temperatures where we can keep one of the boundaries, which is the lower boundary, liquid water. So, so for, for what you saw um, in that plot, if I'm remembering correctly, and, and these are gonna be close, the, the temperature of the lower boundary was about 0 0.5 Celsius, and the temperature of the upper boundary was minus 12 or minus 14. 
So the mean temperature in the chamber was about minus six. So it would be hard for us to explore that parameter space to go to a much uh, a much colder temperature just because of that limitation.